Well, we're going to take a little bit of time in scriptures this morning. We're going to take some time to pause and pray. And, um, and allow God to just speak to us here. So, we're going to talk about prayer. And in addition to that, there is an information, just it's a what we're just calling three years through the Bible. And um, one of the things that we are aware of, uh, we've had leaders that have gathered and had conversation. Some of the places that God is taking us as a church family, we know that we're going to need to get a little bit just better rooted and grounded in the truth of God's Word as well as get close to Him in prayer. So we're asking the entire LCF family if you will join us on a three-year journey. Isn't that crazy? It's like, what, going to college, four years, do it in three years, whatever. The Bible's a big book, but if you go ahead, all those books that are in that one book, but um, if you just, you know, kind of reduce it down to about a chapter a day, and that's what we will be doing for three years, and we'll make it all the way through the Bible. And I want to invite you, but not just invite you, I really want to exhort you to come and join us because this is kind of a corporate and a group declaration that will just say, God, we want to really dig down deep into your word. So many of you have read through the Bible, some of you numerous times, and uh, maybe you read all the way through the Bible last year. I know on uh, New Year's Eve, it was my morning of reading chapter 22 of Revelation. Oh, what a marvelous chapter. <laughs> and, uh, but today, I'd like for you to read Genesis chapter 1. And uh, you've got that handout. You can keep it there. Uh, we'll find other ways to communicate with you. And generally, you're going to have a daily or uh, a weekly devotional that will come out in midweek that's going to take some of the things that we've been reading about and really inspire you of how to apply these things into your life. So Genesis chapter 1, we're going to start in the beginning. would love to have you join us. Tuck that away, whether it's in your Bible, whether it's in your pocket. I don't know if you need to put this on the mirror in your bathroom. I don't know. Wherever you do your Bible reading, you have it in that place. Uh, come with us on the journey. It's going, to, it's going to take us deeper into who He is. So I want to talk to, with you today about prayer. Jesus used these words, and when you pray, um, read this aloud with me, would you? And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your Father who is unseen. And then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. A little bit farther into the message, we will head to that, the thoughts from this passage of Scripture. But... I want to begin by just giving you some considerations concerning prayer. You may be a newbie to this thing. Maybe you've been in a group before and you hear people pray prayers and you go, oh, stank, I wish I prayed like that. It's like, give me, give me, give me a prayer that's maybe written on paper or something like that and I will pray that prayer. Some of you learned prayers and those are the kinds of prayers but I will just tell you this, that prayer is as simple as a relational conversation with God. That's really what prayer is. It's not talking at Him, but it is responding to the very one who has initiated the relationship with us. He's the one that pursued us, especially by, yes, laying out His Word, which is his love language and communication to us. It's full of wisdom. It's full of instruction. It's full of telling us who he is and how he works. And it says a lot about who we are and how messed up we are and how much we need him. And all of these things teach us so much about life. 
But not just in his word. The word became flesh, made his dwelling among us. And when Jesus came into our world, it was God's express statement to us that I am here to be among you and I want relationship with you. It is God's voice that breaks the silence. It draws us to him. C.S. Lewis says that prayer in the sense of petition, asking for things, is just a small part of it. Confession, penitence are its threshold. Adoration, its sanctuary. The presence and vision and enjoyment of God, its bread and wine. God wants to have a relationship with you. So he wants you to come and he wants you to have conversation that declares who he is, but also comes to him and asks for things. In addition to that, it comes to him and declares how much we need him. And also in this conversation, part of it is there are times that we're just still before him and we let him speak to the well of our soul with whispers. Um, sometimes he speaks to us in word pictures. And many times it's just in these thoughts that you know are not your thoughts. And he will speak to you. And the more you read your word, the more you read the Bible, the more you're going to figure out what his voice sounds like. That's really, really important and will help you in understanding and knowing this voice that speaks to us. The great purpose of prayer is to come humbly, expectantly, and because of Jesus, boldly into the conscious presence of God to relate to Him, to talk with Him, and ultimately enjoy Him as our great treasure. That's what He calls us to do. He's opened up the way through Jesus. So come, have relationship with Him. Take moments, set them aside, wait on him, pray. Now, prayer doesn't begin with our needs. It always begins with his abundance, and that's important for us. You don't need to somehow, somehow come to him and twist his arm to answer any of your prayers or meet your needs. In prayer, what we do is we speak to God, who's already spoken. He is a God of abundance. We come to him. Our asking, our pleading, our requesting does not originate from our emptiness, but instead from his fullness. He is a God whose arm is not short. His ear is not dull to our request. He is a God that is, there is no limit to him. He is a God of great abundance. He has declared to us that he will supply all of our needs according to his riches in glory. So remember that when you approach God, he not only is a God of abundance, but in addition to that, because God is loving, caring, and attentive, we petition him for our needs. He is uh, more ready to hear you than you are ready to approach him in prayer. Okay? His ear is bent toward you. It's the next chapter, but Jesus in that Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, verse 11, says, If you then, though you are evil... Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Jesus is explaining. There is a God who is loving. He's attentive. He is caring. And so when we come to him, all of our needs, whether it's for ourselves, our family, our friends, our world, he is more than ready to hear us when we come and approach him in prayer. It's good to know. He has abundance. But he also cares deeply, and so he's ready to act. Now, first and foremost, prayer is orientation of life, rather than the particular practice and pattern. Everything that we do is dependent on God, because prayer is part and parcel of an ongoing relationship with God. In the book of Acts that talks about what these early followers of Jesus were like, after Jesus ascended into heaven, he poured out the Holy Spirit upon them. But that book of Acts doesn't accent the particular times and places of early church prayer, but instead it tells us in these broad sweeping ideas of they were so oriented in their lives toward God. In Acts chapter 1 verse 14, it says they all joined together constantly in prayer. Uh, Paul talks about in, in Romans 12, he charges the church not to specific prescribed habits, to be constant in prayer, he says. Just be constant in prayer. 
In Colossians chapter 4, Paul says to continue steadfastly in prayer in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, to pray without ceasing. And in Ephesians 6 verse 18, to be praying at all times in the Spirit and with all prayer and supplication. Now sometimes it seems really strange to be praying to one that we do not see. And sometimes we have real questions of, I don't know if that prayer got much higher than like here. <laughs> but what the scriptures promise is that there is a God who loves to hear the prayers of his children. And if you read recently Revelation, you will find that there are, there's a marvelous bowl that is completely full of the prayers of the saints. Not one of them has escaped our God. And so this orientation of life where I need God to come through for me. I am dependent on him. I need him to help me in my parenting skills. I need him to help me in my job. I need him to change my life. All of the needs, everything that you have need of, there is a God that he longs for you just to be dependent on him. So orient your entire life. Orient your family. Do it toward prayer. Pray with your children. When your children have needs, pray with them. Please don't use prayer as a, as a I don't know, a hammer to come down on them when the discipline issues take place. <laughs> I've seen some parents that do that, and I always thought, that really isn't fair. It's like, now we're going to really bring God into this issue, and he's been watching, and blah, 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 blah. Talk about uh, God with your kids um, in these times where it's, <laughs> especially where it's like, they, you don't shape uh, the fear um, of God where he's never approachable because he's always watching and he's just ready to smack me. Now, he is a God of judgment. That is true. But he longs for repentance and for us to come to him and lead them in ways that you can maybe say, how about if we talk to God about this? What do you think he wants to hear from you? You want to talk to him? And then I'll talk to him. Orient your life toward prayer. As Christians, we develop habits of life, habits of grace, spiritual discipline, and the spiritual discipline of prayer. It's important for us to find regular time and place. We pray by ourselves. We pray with other people. Now, Jesus had talks specifically, we'll talk more about this, to go to this closed room, this closet. Go to your room, and there you pray. It's a devoted time. It is a place. Prayer should be scheduled, but prayer should also be spontaneous. So it's okay to pray in the car. If you're driving, keep your eyes open. It's okay to pray at the table. It's okay to pray. You pray in between appointments. You pray beside the bed. You pray through Scripture in direct response to God's Word. So we worship God, we give Him thanks, we ask. That's all a part of our prayer lives. We learn to pray by praying and by praying with others. And we discover that praying regularly with others can be one of the most enriching adventures of your Christian life. So I want to challenge you, pray without ceasing. You have God's ear. He promises that that he will be attentive to us. So make the most of it. Make the most of it, would you? In orientation toward life, what I would like for you to do, we got out an email. We're catching up with the holidays, uh, trying to. But we're into a new year. We're heading into Bible reading. We're heading into a week of prayer. You're going to be getting some morning devotionals from us that will uh, every day this week. There's one that was sent out. Um, this morning, but it's going to focus you in on one of the great prayers in the Bible found in the book of Acts chapter 4. It's written by a guy named Luke. He writes a gospel. He writes the book of Acts. If you just go word content, uh, right around one quarter of the New Testament was written by Dr. Luke. 
He was a close companion of the Apostle Paul, and he hung out with the disciples a lot. And he writes out in some very technical doctor words about the story of Jesus. Now, he tells of the account in Acts chapter 4, where John and Peter, in chapter 3, yeah, there was a man, he has been lame from birth. He was born crippled. He would have been positioned outside of the temple, one of the gates that would lead into the temple. And on a daily basis, he would beg. And that's how he would support himself. Peter and John run into him one day. If you ever wondered, surely Jesus would have seen this guy, and why did Jesus never heal him? Maybe he walked by and says, I think I'll leave this one for Peter and John. <laughs> and there he's there, and he asks for alms, and Peter and John, Peter says to him, listen, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up, walk. And the man got up. I learned his kid's chorus. He went walking and leaping and praising God. It, he went walking and leaping and praising God, and it caused quite a commotion. And the Bible says that as a result of it, as word gets out, this church is growing even more. 3,000 were converted on the day of Pentecost, and now somehow there's another 2,000 men um, that have been added. So it speaks of 5,000 men by the time we get to Acts, end of Acts chapter 3 who are followers of Jesus, and that doesn't count the women in that count, evidently. So, uh, but it's happening, and, and as a result, religious leaders are concerned, and so they come and they arrest Peter and John and put them in prison overnight. And they have conversation with them the next day, and they do their best to threaten them. They do their best to shut them down from preaching in the name of Jesus, and especially talking about this resurrection issue. And on their release, they did not beat them because they were afraid of the people. So they released them, but they threatened them strongly. And these were the same ones who killed Jesus. But on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them, and when they heard this, they, the church, and we're not for sure, there's not... 5,000 men and women in any way that are gathered in a room. I, is this the upper room? Is this the leadership team? We're not exactly for sure. But as they welcome back with Peter and John, and they're excited that they've been released, but they begin to pray. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. I wonder what that sounded like. What do you think that sounded like? I think there was some real boldness. Now, there had to have been a number of different things that were prayed, but it's like Luke goes ahead and gives a summary statement of what was being prayed as together they raised their voices and prayed. But here's what they began to pray. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. And they did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. I want to pause here just for a moment. You see, the prayer that begins to emerge, there's first one thing that is very, very clear. And I want to challenge you to pray prayers like this. As Peter and John rejoin the believers, and as they're raising their voices, they understand that the threats are real. And they understand that the heat that Jesus was under, and ultimately what led to his uh, death and crucifixion, and that Jesus had said, you likewise will face persecution on my behalf. They understood that this thing is real. And so they begin their prayer by acknowledging God's sovereignty. Did you catch that? It says, God, you're big. You're the creator of everything. The earth, the world, everything that's in the seas even. By sovereignty, um, 
They were addressing God's authority to not only create the world, but to work out his will and purposes, even through the waywardness of sinful men. So what they understand is this, that here you have a forefather of ours, David, and centuries before, he writes and he tells the story, yes, the anointed one will come, but when he comes, nations will rage. Powerful people will rise up against him. And then they say, but God, they were only working within your time frames and in your purposes. It is only what you allowed to happen. It has been predetermined by you, O oh God. And I want you to think about that, and I want you to pray these kinds of prayers. This is really the passage that I'm going to challenge you today. Pray this prayer. And I want you to apply it into your life. You don't have a Herod. You don't have a Pontius Pilate in your life. But probably every single one of us in the room, there are places where we feel threatened, where we feel insecure, where we feel challenged. And it's like, God, sometimes there are individuals that really hold power. And yet it comes before God and say, but God, you are bigger than every trouble or every foreign entity. Whatever entity I am facing that seems to be outside the scope of what I know you want to do, I know that you are bigger than all of this. It is prayer will come and declare to God, O oh, sovereign God, the creator of all things, I know you are working out your purposes, and that includes the good you have for me, so I trust you, O oh God. You are stronger than any foe that rises against you. When you make prayerful declarations, it will reorient your life back to the safety and security that we are steady in the hands of God. And we want to magnify Him so that He becomes bigger and stronger in our sight. It doesn't change Him, but it changes your perspective on Him. You cannot allow the world and the devil to diminish God in your perspective. Begin your prayers with, God, I know who you are. I orient my life toward the vastness of your plans and your purposes and that you're sovereign God over all of it. And then the prayer in Acts 4 turns to the missional aspect of their lives. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. They do not pray for protection. Luke does not record that they pray for comfort. They do not pray for an easy road ahead. But they ask God for boldness to do what he called them to do. And that's to proclaim the good news of Jesus. And they asked for God to execute powerful, miraculous signs to all to back up the word that they were called to preach. So, a huge part of just our orientation in life is that we remember who God is and his vastness and sovereignty. We declare that in our prayers. And then we come back and we come down to, God, your kingdom come and your will be done. And I know this is what you have called us to do. You have called us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. You have called us to go and make disciples of all nations. And we want to do this, and we want to do it with a real sense of boldness. But God, we've got trouble that's brewing here, and it would be easy for fear to begin to set in. So make us bold and bold for your purposes. These are the kinds of prayers that they prayed, and these are the kinds of prayers that are according to the will of God for your life. So pray these kinds of prayers. Ask God for greater boldness to live your life for Jesus in the public square. Before your family, before your workplace, before your neighborhood, before your friends. Ask God for boldness to have loving conversations with people and also for boldness to demonstrate his love through simple service, kindness, loving people, paying attention. 
It's amazing the kind of platform you can have if you will just pay attention to people. Look them in the eye. Pause. Pay attention to them. Let them know that you see them. Let them know that you care about them. Let them know that you are honestly praying for them through the difficulties of life. If you want to know how to do that, go talk to Evelyn Loudon. She'll tell you. This is how you love your coworkers. This is how you pray for them. Those prayer requests show up on a regular basis every single Sunday. I want you also to note this verse 31. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Luke records this. Something happened when they prayed that kind of prayer. God showed up in powerful ways, and it was like a whole do-over of the day of Pentecost that you'll find in Acts chapter 2. New things happened. The entire place, they felt the shaking of the power of God and His presence there, and He infused spirit boldness into their lives so they could do what God had called them to do. God shook things up. He filled them with the power of the Holy Spirit. And the result was that they were empowered to engage in the mission that Jesus gave them. They did it with boldness. So the final paragraph of your devotion, if you're on the MailChimp mailing list, email list from us, says this. Sometimes it seems as if life can beat you down. That's when you need to keep. We need to keep our heads up, focus on our sovereign God. He still hears us when we ask for His power to live for His mission in this broken world. So pray hard and watch God work. Now, one of the ways that God wants to work in and through your life is He has positioned you. And He did it on purpose. There are people that in your life that you're beside somehow or connected to relationally in life's journey. And here's what I want to challenge you to do. There are people who need to hear the good news of Jesus. Only God can transform their lives. There are people who need to find their way home to God. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to join me. This entire year, in considering who are those individuals, write down their names, and pray for them on a regular basis. Make it a daily commitment, if at all possible, to pray for them and ask God, how do you want me to pray for them, but how do you want me also to serve them, to love them, and then be ready to invite them in some way to some kind of gathering, whether it's here at Life Christian Fellowship, I don't know what it might be, but to extend an invitation for them to join you in a spiritual journey. And as you pray, let's just see what God will do. I had an amazing experience at the men's conference that there are some individuals that I've been praying for. And during one of the songs in the worship setting, I... I just, I had a real, it, anyway, it was an image in my mind's eye, and I knew it was from the Lord. But I saw those individuals in a different way, and I saw them with the light of the glory of God upon them. And as I saw that image, and I kind of paused, of like, God, what are you saying? And, and I, I really sensed it's like God wants them in His kingdom, and he fueled me to pray for them in new ways that I knew their faces would be turned toward God and would see the light of the gospel and really come to know him in a real, deep, meaningful way. And I started journaling it. Just I sat down, and I wasn't taking notes from the speaker, but I just started journaling the, the whole the image that I saw as fast as I could. And then I started to journal a prayer, and I said, God, forgive me because as I've prayed for these individuals, I have not seen them in this kind of light. When I prayed for them, I've seen this for them to come to you as difficult and as almost impossible. And now I'm praying for them, but I'm praying for them in new light because it's light of, 
I know how much Jesus wants to shine into their lives. And I sit back and go, oh, it's just a matter of time. But my eyes will behold it when they come to know him. And their faces are turned and the glory of God comes upon them. It's just a matter of time. Because of the goodness of God when he sent Jesus to be their savior. And I'm trusting him for that. Before we head to the communion table in just a moment, and we'll do that shortly, but I'd like for you to go ahead and jot down some of the names of individuals that you know that they need to be here at the table because Jesus laid down his life for them as well. And we're going to move toward a matter of prayer. Musicians, come on back, would you? Jesus patterned prayer for us to the point that the disciples made this request, Lord, teach us to pray. And there's two things that I want you to realize. The way Jesus patterned it for his followers was he prayed frequently. Jesus dismissed crowds and he went on mountainsides by himself to pray. Luke tells us that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Mark 1 tells us very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went off to a solitary place where he prayed. In Luke 6, it says that one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray, spent the night praying to God, and then he came back and he called his disciples. Three times in Gethsemane, Jesus went away and prayed. Often, Jesus would pray, and he would do it, not as a display of righteousness, but he did it privately. He champions the cause of closet prayer. It gets this name from Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount, those verses that we read. You see, praying in earshot of others had reward to it. Jesus spoke of religious leaders and said they pray, but they pray to impress you and to lay out an image to you and to solicit respect from those around them. It can be easy to slide into impressing others as the driving motivation for our praying with others, for others, whether it's our length, our tone, our topic, our mood, our word choice. We can choose them carefully to produce certain effects in our human hearers alone. In fact, I don't know if you've ever had the experience that as someone prayed, you could really tell they're really not talking to God, they're talking to all of us. As if what? You think we can do anything? Private prayer is an important test of whether we are real. And our world is in desperate need of a real Christianity. Is he our true treasure? Or are we simply using prayer to appear godly and to impress others? Private prayer shows who we really are spiritually and is essential in healing the many places we find ourselves broken, needy, lacking, and rebellious. It's been over 20 years ago, but I read a book penned by a pastor that had a large growing church, but they came to a point where they realized we have grown beyond our ability to be healthy. And he just said we need to really work at health the counseling load, so many different things had become very, very heavy. He said one of the best choices we ever made was before we ever counseled with individuals, we said, we'll meet with you, but before we ever do, you come and you pray for an hour. And most of our counseling appointments, he said, never happened. Because when you pray and you depend on God, in private, quiet places, it is amazing to see what God will do. In fact, Jesus says, the Father who hears you in secret, he will come and he will reward you. So I want to challenge you. 
during this week, find some times. Maybe it's a lunch hour every day. Head into just a season of prayer and waiting on God. Take those verses in Acts chapter 4 today and use that and pray through that. Put God in His rightful place that He's big and over it all. And then come and you ask Him for His help to remain bold and strong in the mission that He's given you in life. This is what He calls us to. Be people who humble ourselves before Him and we pray. Oh God, we ask of you that you will help us to be better at leaning into you, depending on you, and waiting on you. We confess to you that we are busy and we are problem solvers and we are helpers. And oftentimes, God, in our rush to help, we push you out of the way. You have not called us to be saviors to any individual. There's only one. His name is Jesus. But you have called us to be humble servants who wait on you. And so we ask of you to take us deeper into your word this year and take us deeper into the pursuit of waiting on you. When we wait on you, you said we renew our strength. Even the young ones grow very weary and tired. But all who wait on God hopefully wait on you. Our strength is renewed. We remember, Jesus, what you did for us. We especially want to be mindful of those who are prodigals. They're away from you. They haven't found their way home to you yet. And we ask God for them. I have family members who need you. I have neighbors who need you. I have friends who need you. And we ask, Father, that you would use us this year to be ones who point the way, give us a boldness. Most of all, give us a boldness to love unconditionally. We ask these things because of Jesus our Savior and Sovereign One. <laughs> Jesus, thank you for opening up access to our Heavenly Father so that we can boldly approach Him in our time of need. sing this song and as we do maybe there's the beginning maybe you came in after um, but there's just a white card that you have maybe there's something you need to let go of and leave behind there's a cross in the back you can jot down what it is it can be just one simple word there's some push pins in the back leave it at the foot of Jesus in just a moment we'll receive communion I need those who are serving to come down to the front